I don't know very much about this topic. I'm not sure that I'll be able to answer your questions. And I don't know if I'll be very helpful to you at all. I hear these words all the time. I'm a social scientist, and I study the social dimensions of climate change and climate-related disasters. And that means that I spend a great deal of my time talking to people who have extremely important, in-depth knowledge about climate events. But I'm always surprised because when I first sit down to talk to these people, these are often the first words that they say to me. These people that I talk to most are not climate scientists or climatologists, although I do work with those experts as well. But the experts that I talk to most are the invisible experts. They're experts who, experts in the lived experience of climate change, of a climate extreme. They're people who have seen their entire livelihoods threatened and sometimes even decimated by a single climate event. The people, the experts that I talk to most are farm women. They're farm women that live and work here in the Canadian prairies and around the world. They are experts who live on farms near towns that have names like Elbow and Ituna and Carrot River. And if, like me, you're from rural Saskatchewan, then you know all about these kinds of places. And so I grew up on a farm in rural Saskatchewan near a town named Kelvington. And growing up, I spent my childhood doing things like going on walks, adventures through the bush with my dogs, and getting my legs all cut up from running through fields full of wheat stubble. And like all farmers, my parents experienced dry years and droughts. They experienced extreme precipitation and flash floods that wiped out crops. But I was lucky because as a child, I was relatively sheltered from most of it. I do remember one year, though. It was the drought, the severe drought, that hit Saskatchewan in the late 1980s. And it was so dry that year that the soil in our yard was cracking, was forming these large gulfing cracks all around the yard. And I was just a little kid at the time, but my mom tells me, and I have a vague recollection of it, my mom tells me that I spent a lot of time that year with my little watering can, going around our yard and wandering, uh, watering the cracks in the yard because I was afraid that those cracks were going to turn into earthquakes. 20 years later, I moved to a large city. I moved to Toronto as a young adult. And it was during my time living in a large city, in a large urban space, that I realized how often rural people and rural places, like the people and places that I knew growing up, get overlooked. And I learned how frequently their contributions, like their contributions to our food system, get ignored. And I began to realize even further that amongst this whole ignored rural sphere of agricultural people and agricultural places, that farm women, specifically, are the invisible food producers. And their invisibility is a product of a culture that for a very long time has equated the word farmer with the image of a man. And that's why here in North America, especially when I say the word farmer, most people are very likely to envision someone who looks a lot like this. That's why, when I say the word farmer, most people are very unlikely to envision someone who looks like this, or perhaps like this. And that's why, when I sit down with farm women, farm women who make absolutely crucial contributions to our food system, farm women who play essential roles in Canadian agriculture, they tend to describe those crucial contributions, those essential roles, using words like helper, supporter, employee, and hired man. And this invisibility, this marginalization of women's contributions to agriculture exists around the world. In low-income countries, the countries of the global south, countries that we used to call the third world, women actually constitute the majority of agricultural producers, but they do this agricultural production on the smallest plots of land, they do it on the most marginal and the least productive plots of land. And they do it in some countries on land that they can't even hold in their own names. And they do it without access to many of the economic and agricultural resources that we would consider to be essential for agriculture. And so, in 2009, 
I began a research project where I wanted to begin to value the contributions of farm women. And I wanted to consult with farm women as experts in their fields. And so I drove around the province of Saskatchewan and I sat down in farm women's kitchens and we talked. And we talked about things that are commonly associated with women. So we talked, for example, about the fact that here in Canada and around the world, and especially in rural places, farm women and women in general continue to do an overwhelming majority of domestic work, of housekeeping work, of caregiving for children and for the elderly. And that these contributions are far less likely than other kinds of work, especially paid work, to be recognized and to be valued. But we didn't stop there. So we didn't stop talking at the things that are commonly associated with women. We went on and we talked about the changing nature of rural societies. We talked about the industrialization of Canadian agriculture. We talk about changes in agricultural policy, and we talk about climate change. And it's through these conversations that I have come to know that climate change has gendered impacts. And it's this connection, this in, often invisible connection between gender and climate change, a connection that's often invisible, just like farm women themselves are invisible, that I would like to share with you today. And let's start by talking a bit about climate change. What is climate change? There are, like, according to climate science, this is what climate science tells us, there are two types of climate change. The first is natural climate cycles. So these are the natural cycles of the climate that exist over decades, over centuries. These are natural cycles that have caused wet years and dry years, hot, cold, throughout our history on this planet. These are natural cycles that have caused us in the past to experience flooding and droughts. But there's a second type of climate change. And the second type of climate change is called anthropogenic climate change. And anthropogenic climate change means human-induced or human-caused climate change. And this means that our activities as humans on this planet are affecting the environment. It means that our production of fossil fuels, our, production of green, our burning of fossil fuels, our production of greenhouse gases, all of these things are interfering with that first type of climate change, the natural cycles. And although here in Saskatchewan, our climate scientists expect that over the next few decades, our climate will be dominated by that first type, the natural cycles. We can expect that over the longer term, we here in Saskatchewan and in the Canadian prairies can expect to experience more severe precipitation and flash flooding. We can expect to experience longer, more protracted droughts and more extremes in general as that second type of climate change, that anthropogenic type, interacts with the natural cycles of the climate. And we have to be prepared for this. And being prepared for this means acknowledging that not everybody is affected in the same way by climate change. It means acknowledging that although we here in the Canadian prairies may not start to feel the worst effects of climate change for some time yet, people around the world are living climate change right now. We have climate refugees. The residents of the Cataract Islands near Papua New Guinea have been evacuated from their islands. The Republic of the Maldives has been sounding the alarm on climate change for decades. And a few years ago, NASA scientists identified the Canadian prairies as a hotspot for future climatic change. So we have to be ready. And being ready for climate change means more than just the kind of technological fixes that we might talk about as adaptation. It means acknowledging that certain groups of people, just like the Cataract Islanders, are going to be more or less affected by climate change. And it means acknowledging that our existing forms of social inequality, so social inequality that exists along the lines of gender, race, socioeconomic class, all of the different ways that people in our society are either privileged or disadvantaged, means that those different groups of people will be affected differently by climate change. And we need to prepare for that as well. So when we begin to notice inequality and social inequality in climate change, that's when we begin to notice, for example, that climate change has gendered impacts. And so it's when we begin to notice gender and climate change that we begin to notice that in the aftermath of almost any climate-related event around the world, rates of violence against women increase dramatically. 
And it's when we begin to notice climate, uh, gender and climate change that we begin to notice, for example, that in the case of many places around the world that are prone to floods and cyclones, that women are more likely to die as a result of those floods and cyclones than men. And the reason that women are often more likely to experience a climate event as fatal is because in some parts of the world, women and girls are not taught how to swim. And in some parts of the world, it's considered inappropriate for a woman to leave her home during a disaster, especially if her clothes have become saturated with flood water. And it means acknowledging that in food shortages that are associated with droughts, in many places around the world, women eat last. And this means that climate change has gendered impacts. But gender is complex, just like climate change. And so it's important to look at specific examples, specific contexts of how this plays out. And so we could take, for example, the case of Hurricane Mitch, which hit parts of Nicaragua and Honduras in 1998. And in the case of Hurricane Mitch, it was actually men that were more likely to die than women. And the reason for that is because gender does not equal women. Men experience gendered roles and gendered expectations as well. And in the case of Hurricane Mitch, Men were expected to be heroes. It was men who were expected to be rescuers and to go rushing into the disaster when everybody else was trying to rush out. And it's when we take this complex gender lens and start to notice the gendered impacts of climate change that we see in the same disaster, in the case of Hurricane Mitch, it was female-headed households, which around the world are more likely to be poor than any other kind of household, who had the most difficulty recovering. And that's true in many cases of climate events around the world. And we saw that in the case of Hurricane Mitch, as well as many other climate extremes, we see that it's women agricultural producers, farm women, who often have the most difficulty recovering their operations after a disaster. And the reason for that is because they lack the access to basic resources to recover those operations. And so this is what we begin to see when we see gender in climate change. But we should bring that gender lens close to home as well. And when I start to talk to Saskatchewan farm women about their experiences of, clim of cl a climate disaster, like a flood or a drought, I hear really important stories. I hear, for example, the story of one young farm woman who told me about how difficult it was for her to try to raise her small child while she and balance all of her other activities, while she was spending several hours each and every day driving back and forth to a nearby community that was less hard hit by the drought, so that she could haul big tanks of water just to do basic things like laundry, bathe her children, feed her livestock, water her livestock. And I hear the stories like that of an older farm woman who told me about how she pulled her family and her farm through a very severe drought on their operation. And she did that by cobbling together whatever off-farm employment she could get. So she worked for the census that year. She did telemarketing. She did whatever kind of work she could do to ensure that her family and her farm made it through the drought. And probably the most common thing that I hear from farm women is about the ex how the experience of a disaster depends so much on their emotional labor. And women tell me about how they put their own stress, their own worry to the side. They ignore their own feelings of distress so that they can hold everybody else together, so that they can hold their families together, their communities. And one woman told me about how she would resort to using phrases that she kept in her head, like maybe tomorrow will be better or let's just hold on one more year. And they told me about this stress that they experienced. And it's this stress that tells me that climate extremes here in Saskatchewan also have gendered impacts. What you see here are three generations of farm women in my own family. And like them, I believe that we need more women in agriculture. I believe that we need more women in the fields. I believe that we need more women working with livestock. And especially, I believe that we need more women calling themselves farmers. But I think that we need to go more broadly than that. And so I think 
we need to begin to broaden our understanding of what counts as farm work. Because when I talk to farm women around the province and I ask them, what kind of work do you do on the farm? And they tell me about the fact that they work in the field and that they work with livestock. But they tell me more often a lot of other things, things that are far less likely to be recognized as farming. So they tell me, for example, about how many hours it takes to do the books and the accounting for an ever-expanding farm operation. And they tell me, for example, about how much work it takes to put a three-course meal on the table at lunch and then again at dinner every day through harvest season. And they tell me about feeling like they are always on call, always on call to go get this tractor part or on call to move that piece of equipment. And they tell me, like one farm woman did, about the many hours that she spent driving, uh, mowing the grass around her grain bins in her yard because mowing the grass helped to prevent the rats from getting into the grain bins and eating the farm's source of income. And all of this work is important and all of this work is essential to farming, but it's very often the invisible farming. It's the work that doesn't get recognized as agriculture. And so I would like us to begin to expand our definition of what counts as farming and who counts as a farmer. And when we do that, I think that we'll begin to see how to prepare ourselves for future climate change. I would like our governments and our policymakers to consult with farm women as experts in agriculture because they are experts in agriculture. And it's their voices, it's hearing the voices of the invisible food producers, the voices that are least often heard, that we will begin to understand where we need to go and what we need to do in order to prepare ourselves for future climate change. It's through listening to these voices that we will begin to see that preparing for climate change is about more than just building a taller, higher bridge or developing a more drought-resistant crop. It means listening and paying attention to social inequality, to invisibility. It means doing things like encouraging girls in Bangladesh to learn how to swim so that they can have a fighting chance of surviving the next flood. And it means encouraging girls here in Saskatchewan to become farmers. So, and when they do become farmers, encouraging them to see themselves as farmers in their own right. And even more than that, encouraging them to be leaders in agriculture and to be leaders especially in developing more environmentally responsible ways of doing agriculture. And that's why when all of these things happen, I think that in the future, I'll be hearing a lot less of this from our next generation of farm women and a lot more of this. Thank you very much.